with uh, two or three remarks, uh, sort of half questions. Um, one of the things you pointed out is that when we talk about the 8% solution, the 8% growth, it, is, it has to take place over a long period of time, sustained growth over two, three decades. Now, the first thing that came to my mind again is, and we were talking about this earlier, that when I read your book, I, I am not an economist. I read it as a political scientist. So, so my questions are going to be of a slightly different nature. Now, the problem for me is that when you say that these are the kinds of policies that can achieve long-term growth. And the first thing that comes to my mind is that governments, uh, especially democratic governments, have a, a short-term uh, reference, right? I mean, so you have elections every five years, uh, you have state-level elections, you have, you have other competing uh, interests, right? So one, um, in democratic situations, and that is why lots of political scientists and social scientists in the past have recommended, you know, more authoritarian forms of government because, you know, authoritarian governments, authoritarian states can plan policy over the long term and the East Asian success stories where you point out the state even you know, nudged, more than nudged corporations in a particular direction and we can't do that anymore. So uh, one, I see that as a, as a big challenge in, in you know, designing uh, any, any policy. Uh, the second thing is that uh, this is a bit of a puzzle and I'm sure that economists have an answer to this, is that you're talking about savings and investment, right? And I, I suppose what you had in mind is, or, or what you're probably hinting at is, is it private investment? Because the way I see it, uh, savings, higher savings or higher you know, take home income basically means more consumption. Mm. And if there is more consumption, then, then uh, big business or businesses have a greater incentive to invest. Right. So talking about the post COVID economy, when, you know, India's inequalities have already, you know, have been happening, increasing over a period of time. So the household sector is clearly suffering. Uh, it may be a bit more, a bit about both, that there's more to consume and, you know, more is being marketed, so to say, and, uh, you know, incomes have not risen fast enough. So some combination of both. But the point is that less disposable income means less consumption also. And less consumption means that, you know, if I am planning to inc increase production of uh, X or Y, which is, you know, uh, you know low-level consumer good, then uh, what incentive do I have to produce more shoes or more toothpaste or when people are switching to, you know, uh, Nimka, uh, Datwa or whatever. So, so you get the idea. That's, that's the second observation. The third one is a larger uh, issue again, which is, uh, I mentioned that, which is the interactions between these four, um, you know, actors, so to say the household, uh, the government, <coughs> corporate groups, and external. And again, within that you have, you know, large business, small business, and all, all those things. But the interaction between the government and each one of these three, other than an economic relationship, there is also a political relationship, right? So one of the things we often ask in political science, or one of the things that people are asking these days is, well, if the economy is not doing so well for 90% of the population, why are people still voting for the same people, uh, for the same guys in power, right? So if my economic situation worsens, typically I punish the government in power, right? So that which, which tells you is that irrespective of, in some ways, the economic relationship between the government and the household sector, which is citizens voters in some ways, uh, it just doesn't matter. So you can define your economic relationship in spite or, or by ignoring, even by ignoring the political relationship. But that's rare. I mean, every now and then that might happen and we are in that period of time where despite worsening incomes, where despite increasing inequality, increasing privatization, uh, lower salaries, etc., the government is not being taken to task either at the state level or the national level and so on and so forth. And people are sort of puzzled about it, right? So the political relationship, again, between government and household groups, but also the political relationship between the government and powerful business, big business. Uh, you know, whether it's tax rates, whether it is various kinds of incentives, whether in the United States, whether in Europe, and we, every, we see everywhere that 
big corporations are having more and more influence over government policy making, right? So uh, this is this is something that not bothered me, but I saw, thought, well, you know, if a political economist was writing about these things, how differently he would approach the subject matter. I'll stop here, and uh, you know, maybe you could quickly respond to that, and then we'll go uh, over to audience questions. Sure. Thank you very much, Dr. Pushka. Okay, so two, uh, three questions you asked, right? To answer your first question, uh, democracy versus autocracy, we are short term in our behavior. We have roughly like three years of cycle because one, the last two years are effectively spent in preparing for the elections that are coming. If that is what the reality is, then I don't think it is possible for any economy to achieve at 8% uh, kind of growth for 20, 25 years, which is the objective with which we started, right? So if the objective is that I want to grow at higher pace for a long period of time, then I assume that the policy makers are not bound by that, that short term behavior wherein they are just looking at three years. That is an implicit assumption wherein, let's say, I. I I think the government feels so confident that they are going to remain in power for the next 15, 20 years. Only then this kind of thing is possible, which is exactly what happened in all the South Korea or East Asian countries that we saw. We had autocracy there, which provided the comfort to the ruling party that I don't have any problem even if I take a lot of unpopular policies. And that is why my assumption is that the government is not bound by these considerations if the objective is to grow at 8% for a long period of time. Second question, savings versus investment, wherein you said that why would there be more investments if actually consumption comes off? I'm absolutely with you. And that is why I'm saying that whenever you start addressing the problem of savings, you will have a few years of slower GDP growth. Because, at, so there are only two possible things that can play out. The best scenario, the most desirable scenario is if for some reason household income growth starts picking up. If for some reason household income growth, which has averaged like 6% vis-a-vis 7% consumption growth, let's say household income growth at 8% for XYZ reasons, then I can continue my consumption growth at same 7% and my savings will also get rebuilt. But that is like chasing the tail. I want higher GDP growth and I'm starting with an assumption of higher income growth. That's why my recommendation in my base case is that what, uh, uh, my base case is not that income growth will start picking up at a faster pace in the near future. My, and that is why if I have to rebuild savings, my consumption growth has to come off. And as and when that happens, the incentives for the producers to invest more will also come off, which means we will have lower GDP growth. Please understand there is a well-established literature, higher savings at a time of weak income growth implies weaker GDP growth in the near future. There is no way out to that. That is established. But what happens after a point in time when my savings are higher, when my consumption is low enough that my savings are at a particular level and there are no incentives for the investments to happen, then the difference between savings and investment will actually turn positive. Remember the equation I told you, investments is equal to savings plus CAD, which means current account deficit or current account balance is actually the difference between savings and investments. So as we go through that process where savings are picking up and investments are coming off during a low GDP growth period, there will come a time when we will become a current account surplus country, when savings will be more than investment which means I will have more funds domestically than the demand of those funds. So when that happens, no doubt your GDP growth will be weak, but what will happen with that? Your interest rate will start falling because the supply of funds is more than the demand for funds. At a, after a point in time, your interest rates will become so low, your current account will become so good and generally your GDP growth will have become so low that the producers will realize that this is the bottom. 
Now consumption growth cannot fall below this. Now savings cannot rise above this. And the interest rates now are attractive enough for me to take this risk to start expanding my capacity. That is when that entire virtuous cycle of investments leading to employment growth, leading to higher income generation, higher employment generation, higher consumption, and thus leading to higher investments will happen. OK, so I'm just not making this up. First of all, this is established theory. And the recent example we have in India itself, what happened during 2004 to 8, when we saw this entire virtuous cycle, the seeds of those cycles were actually what happened in 99 to 2003. So since 1950, between 1950 and 2023, India has never ever run a current account surplus for three consecutive years, except one episode. India has never run current account surplus for three years or more, except one episode, and that episode was 2000 to 2003. That time, my GDP growth was as low as 4%. My savings rate was as low as 20%. And my investment rate was only about 21%, 22%. That was the situation in 1999. 2003, 2004, my average GDP growth was still 4%. My savings rate, which was 20, 21%, it became 20 to 23%. And my investments, which were 21, 22%, they fell below 20%. So my current account surplus was 2%, which was a deficit of 1.5% in 1999. And then, along with the entire globalization cycle, we saw the entire world economy growing well. That current account surplus provided the room for Indian economy to grow at 8%. So just as I told you, we had a current account deficit of minus 1.5, current account deficit of 1.5, and, and surplus of 2 so in just those four years, 99 and 2003, my current account balance moved by more than three percentage points. From 2004 to 2008, I moved from plus two to minus two and a half. So my current account deficit balance actually moved by minus four and a half percentage points. Now just imagine, had my current account balance instead of plus two percent, let's say been minus one percent in 2003. Had my current account, instead of plus 2, been minus 1, if I had to repeat the 2003 to 8 cycle, it tells me that my current account deterioration has to be 4.5 percentage points of GDP, which means my current account deficit would have been 5.5% of GDP in 2008, which is simply not possible. So in order to grow fast, in order to grow your investments, you need space. You need space to allow investments to grow. One of the ways to allow that space is first, your savings are higher, and second, you have the space on your current account, because whenever, whenever investments pick up, your current account deficit will widen. It will widen. It widened in 1980s, it widened in 2000, it widened in South Korea in the initial stage, it widened in China in the initial stage as well. I'm not sure if many of you would know South Korea, we know it's, it's, it's a poster child for us. We want to replicate it as much as possible, although there are many policies which just are not possible to replicate. South Korea runs a very high current account surplus today. It's generally a twin surplus country. They run a surplus on their fiscal balance as well as current account. But it used to run a current account deficit of as high as 5 to 10% of GDP during 1960s as much as 5 to 10% of GDP current account deficit. During those times, that time it was possible. This time, no major country can even imagine to run a current account deficit. So it, it puts a constraint on you. I just cannot do that. So I have to do things differently. And my understanding is that in order to do things differently, we have to slow. So I am with you. Whenever we follow this approach of pushing savings higher, GDP growth will come off. But after a point in time, this entire virtuous cycle pick up. Lastly, on political relationship, my answer is going to be very short on this because I don't have too much knowledge about this. But you are absolutely right. There are relationships, government vis-a-vis -vis household sector, government vis-a-vis -vis corporate sector, government vis-a-vis -vis big corporate sector. 
all these relationships can eventually be proven or disproven using data as well, right? And what my understanding of the past successful economies tells me is that the relationship, it's the government, it's a policy makers actually which choose a scenario wherein they improve their relationships with one segment of the economy and they actually implicitly, even though we are talking about autocracies because most of these economies did not have democracy when they had this high growth period, they actually worsen their relationships with one of the participants. So what I'm saying, which is mentioned in the report, one of the established ways to achieve high GDP growth is to support the producer's community, is to support the corporate sector. And when we say corporate sector, big corporate sector in particular, tax cuts, tax cuts subsidies, corporate subsidies, you ignore the environmental damage that is being done by producers. All these countries have done all of this. You talk about the US, you talk about the UK, you talk about South Korea, China, Singapore, all countries have done that. There is this established thing that they have given massive, massive subsidies, incentives, financial, non-financial to all the producers. But please understand when we talk about economy, it's all about trade-offs. If I decide to give something to someone else, I have to find money to give that thing. So either I give it out of my own pocket or I give it from some other sector. Government does not have its, any, its own pockets. They always take money from someone and take it, give it to someone else. Money. <laughs> I print money, right? So what they did when they incentivize a producer's community, they actually took the money from the consumers, which is the household sector. So in all these countries, they favored the corporate sector. They took money from the household sector. Now, how did they do that? One of the, again, established thing is you keep the income level suppressed. Income, labor cost, as we call it, is the biggest cost for the producers. And it is the revenue from the consumer sector. So by suppressing income growth, you are actually incentivizing producers and you are actually putting the household sector, the consumer sector at disadvantage. Now what happens when you suppress income, then my ability to spend or my ability to consume will go down. But as a producer, your ability to produce will go up. So you will produce more goods and services, but I'll be consuming less goods and services. What will you do with the difference? Export. You will export it. Right? And with all the benefits that the government is giving you in terms of subsidies, labor cost, you actually are producing. The only thing which the government has to ensure from the private sector is that your goods are of supreme quality. Because if you are going to compete in the global market, quality cannot be compromised. And this is what all these countries have done. They deliberately decided to keep domestic consumption spending low so that producers can be incentivized and whatever extra is produced, you go in the outside market and sell it to the rest of the world. And that is how this entire export linked or investment linked economic growth model that we all hear about is linked with the framework that I have used. So yes, there are, I, I, I hope these are called political relationships. I'm not sure if I'm answering your questions correctly. These will always remain, you know, ongoing, yeah. <laughs> part of ongoing discussions. So, um, uh, audience questions, please. We'll take at least two or three. Namaskar. Uh, my name is Ranodhir Mukhopadhyay. Thing is that uh, what we have uh, described, very nice presentation, eight person solution. But basically, there is not much solution in it. Thing is that presently, the GDP, which we have been talking about, high GDP rate and all, GDP is on the verge of going away. GDP doesn't reflect the economic situation of a country. GDP is going away. It is being replaced by GPI, Genuine Progress Indicator. That takes care of the environmental cost and the social cost that go, goes with the production. There is no point in producing something 
at the cost of environment and society and keeping the invest what is that your consumption low that was okay for countries like south korea and other where the population is less in india itself is a huge market why you should reduce the consumption part if we start consuming the things what has been produced by our people it will be a huge market everybody can live so happily there is no point in uh, taking money from the householders and giving away to the uh, producers we are giving producers like anything we are waving up the uh, what is the bank loans in thousands of crores of rupees what is the audit of that one there is no audit i would like to also add to one more thing that how, how this uh, demonetization has helped or deteriorated our whole economy we have talked about the economy the gdp is not gone up and all these things investment is coming down investment is uh, coming down now that how demonetization has helped or this uh, uh, harmed the economy third point what i would like to mention is that you mentioned about four sectors corporate governance government uh, what is it your that you know the household and others i think we should also include society we should also include ecology and e e environment and that is the reason why the democracy comes into the picture there is no point in having an autocracy and having a good gdp you should have democracy have a discussion with all the sectors and then come out with your plan i may be wrong but probably this is the only way a country like india india is completely different than other singapore you have talked about singapore singapore is so small south korea is nothing in front of india india is a, itself is a huge market so things should be different and we must take everybody into the uh, confidence and do it thank you very much sir thank you okay this shall i answer or shall i take the questions first Shall I take I a quick? I think qu it's a longish question, so might as well answer. Okay, okay. So, so first question is on GDP versus GPI, or there is something called gross happiness index as well, and a lot of human development index. Okay, so as I mentioned before, I started my discussion. I'm starting with an objective. The objective is to achieve high GDP growth for a sustainable period of time. GPI or GHI or any other measure. if my objective is to achieve a high rating on that then my solutions will be different gdp measures a particular thing it measures the value of goods and services produced in the economy it does not care about happiness it does not care about environment it does not take into factor all those things so if you bring in all those factors into this equation then this entire analysis will have to be reworked on i don't have that capacity <laughs> but this answers your third question as well because you are saying we we have to be careful about what is happening to ecology what is happening to environment all that said and done i am with you but if you want to be so cautious of all these things then it's better if you forget about 8% gdp growth on a sustainable basis i mean just to give you an example if i have come through plane then car that is definitely not the most ecology or environment friendly way to travel right but still i prefer that because of my convenience because that is adding more to gdp growth vis a vis more ecological or environmental friendly thing so with one objective one solution if your objective changes then the solutions will also change demonetization very short answer i don't think it was a good policy i don't see i don't understand matlab it's like when the demonetization was announced the objective was something different we learned that objective was not met when we learned that almost the entire amount of money into the system is back with the rbi and then we learned that the objectives are actually different from what we were told earlier so based on the original objectives my understanding is demonetization was not a sound policy it was not a good economic policy i think i answered all the questions thank you Uh, um, your point that uh, in the last 20 years before covid the household
consumption has is ex, uh, the rate of growth of household consumption is exceeding the rate of savings and this is going to sort of uh, slow down the creation of asset potential in our country this point is well well made and well taken uh, investment uh, asset creation investment also comes from the government and from the private se corporate sector my so i want to make two comments and wanting your response is the investment made by the government sufficient to uh, compensate for the slack in the household uh, uh, savings and investment first and second there is I, I read in the newspapers not very very often but occasionally that uh, the private sector investment is not happening so, so how does that affect um, our India's uh, GDP growth rate potential so these two comments uh, yeah so first on government investments <coughs> Okay, government investments are primarily infrastructure investments, be it state or central government. And when we talk, mostly when we talk government investment, we talk about central government investment or union government investments. And their investments are primarily only in three areas, defense, railways and roads. Now defense is something where a lot of things needs to be done, massive investments is required and that is, I believe will continue to be the case. Railways and roads, I believe that they can be privatized and that is somewhere, that is, an, that is, they are the areas where the government should not be the primary spender. They should be the facilitator rather than doing the investment themselves. But to answer your question whether government investments can actually offset the weak investments or uh, that are being done by the private sector, the answer is no. And I tell you why. Actually your two questions are linked. It's like whether government investments can, uh, because private investments are weak, can government investments offset weak private investments? During the last four years, central government capex has actually increased by more than 3x. In just four years, it has actually more than 3x. In absolute terms, it was about 3 trillion rupees in FY20, which was a pre-COVID year. And in FY24, it was more than 10 trillion rupees. So from 3.3, it has moved to 10 trillion in just four years. For next year, FY25, they are telling us there will be more than 11 trillion rupees. So if I look at central government capex, I will be like, wow. If it's capex, then definitely India's total capex to GDP should also go up. But that has not happened. Why? Because when you look deeper into central government capex, you will actually re realize that almost the entire increase in central government capex is not new capex. What they have done, almost all of these capex in roads, railway sectors were actually done by PSUs earlier, be it NHAI, be it Ministry of Railways. So there are, just like we have state-owned enterprises in China, we have central public sector enterprises in India called CPSCs. CPSCs, which and all the NHAIs or all the roads authorities, all the railways, IRFC, which take loans on behalf of Ministry of Railways to invest on behalf of Ministry, they all used to do CAPEX under CPSCs before FY21. So just to give you a number, Centers capex in FY20 was 1.5% of GDP and now it is 3.5% of GDP. 1.5 to 3.5 FY20, FY24. If you look at CPSC's capex, it was 2.3% of GDP in FY20, it is 0.9% in FY24. 1.5 to 3.5, 2 2.3 to 0.9. If you add them up, you will see that it was 3.8% then, it is somewhere like 3.94% now. So not much increase in CPSs plus central government. 
most of the increase that we see in center scapex is actually a reallocation away from the CPSCs. From the economics perspective, it does not add anything because if the road is built by NHAI, which is a government agency, or the road is built by the government, or if the railway lines are put in by the Ministry of Railways, or if they are put in by the government in themselves, there may be some efficiency benefits, definitely, because if NHI borrows from the market, it would be slightly on a higher rate than what the government of India is borrowing at. But then we also need to understand that my government debt is going up, not the corporate debt, because NHI is a part of corporate sector and government uh, is government of India. So I'm improving efficiency, but I'm improving efficiency by actually shifting capex and borrowings from the corporate sector to the government sector. So on investment, sticking to the capex part, government capex, first of all, we need to really understand if it is actually going up, but it is definitely not replacing private capex. Second, private capex, now private capex has two parts. One is corporate and one is household. Both are private sector capex. Household capex, as I mentioned at the beginning, it primarily it is residential property market. And household capex is doing extremely, extremely well for the past two and a half years or so. It was a serious laggard prior to COVID-19, almost for a decade, from FY11 to FY20. And from FY22 onwards, household capex or the residential property market is doing really well. What is the weak point within the private capex is the corporate capex. And if you actually dig deeper into the corporate capex, it is actually the unlisted corporate sector. It is actually the not so organized, not so large companies which are unable to add capex because listed companies which are largely very organized, very systematic, large companies. Their financial position has improved a lot. Their profits have gone up, their leverage has gone down, their cash flows have improved, they have gained market share. On the other end, the unlisted companies, of course, if they have gained market share, they have lost market share. When we talk about profits, we know for sure that profits of unlisted companies have gone down. In FY23, they are better than 21, but they're definitely much weaker than pre-COVID levels. Their leverage has not come off. Their leverage has come off. So unlisted companies have actually are the one which are unlisted companies and public sector companies, which I just explained. They are the one which are pulling down private capex as such. Otherwise, household, listed corporate, and central government are doing really well in capex. But for again, when we talk about overall economy, every part has to do well if you really want a high growth. Uh, we'll come back to you. Let's have a couple of questions students. from students here. Um, hello. Hello, sir. I'm Saloni from SS Dempo College of Commerce and Economics. And my question to you is, uh, what was the most challenging aspect of writing this book? To find out time to write the book. Because I'm actually, I, it, I think I was able to finish this book only because of COVID-19. And I tell you how, because I'm into a full-time job, right? And being in stock market, I don't want to scare you, but it's a taxing job. It was only because of COVID-19 when I had nothing to do on my weekends, right? I had to go to the outside, to relatives, to friends, to malls, to coach, to travel, everything was so that was the time that helped me and that was the most difficult part because after 2021, I was halfway through the book, but everything opened up and now my weekends were not free. My week weekdays were already taken by the job. So that is the most difficult aspect that I have. While Thank, you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Hello. Uh, so uh, my question was uh, whether the tax cut in the income tax um, would actually help the uh, investment grow in the uh, public sector or anywhere. Uh, so I uh, just recently uh, 
saw interview of uh, Subramanian Swami. So uh, what he was saying that uh, you just less the income tax and it will help the and you tell them to use that tax for investment somewhere. So is it going to help increase it? When you say tax cut, I assume you're talking about corporate tax cut. Uh, he's talking about income tax. Income tax cut, <coughs> personal income tax cut for yeah. individuals. Then how will it grow investment in public health or etc? Then you tell that uh, use that uh, uh, whatever the tax you were supposed to pay, use it for somewhere for investment. Why not for consumption? I give you. I ask you, if you are earning hundred rupees today and you have to pay 30 rupees in taxes. 70 rupees you are consuming, you are investing, you are saving. Tomorrow government tells you, okay, I have been taking too much tax from you, now pay me only 20, not 30. What will you do with your 10 rupees? No, anything. You uh, just invest so that it will go, grow something bigger in the future. So his suggestion was so, like that. Okay, my, what I am trying to say for householder, for individuals, the primary investment is residential property market, which is a very high ticket item. Right? Just because I get tax cuts, tax cuts kitna mil jayega mirko? 2%, 4%, 5%, 6%. That would not be enough for an individual to actually invest because investment for individual is a very high ticket item. I have to be told that I will not be paying taxes for a few years to convert <laughs> that saved money into investment. Most likely if I get tax cuts, I will be spending on consumption, not on investments. So consumption and investment are two different spending items. Uh, one more? Are you a bright young economists of the future? Anyone? Okay. Hi. Hi, Nikhil. My name is Vasu. Uh, I have two questions for you. One is, have you done this analysis or comparison pre-GST and post-GST? Is there any change in consumption, income, total savings, and so on? And second question is, what if personal income tax is totally abolished? Hmm. How does that change anything? Thank you. So when you're saying pre-post-GST, are you saying that income growth and consumption growth gap that is there, has it changed? No, so I can tell you that income growth was lagging consumption growth starting FY13 and they continued continuously for like four or five. So GST came in FY17, right? June, June 16 or June 17, GST. June 17 it came in. June 17, which means FY18. So I can tell you annual data suggests that income growth was lagging consumption growth, FY13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, it improved, 20, 21, 22, 23, it is again weakening. So I don't think it is purely because GST was an inflection point in terms of households financial position behavior. If personal income tax is abolished, so what is the question? If it is abolished, then what? Does that aid or hurt the GDP? Does it have anything to do at all with it? I'm sure it will do, uh, it can do a lot of things, but I have not done such analysis because, no, it, <laughs> it actually includes a lot of different scenarios. I'm not sure how I can do even econometric analysis for that. Because you will have to put so many indicators, you will have to make so many different assumptions. Very difficult question, sir. No, I don't have an answer. I don't have an answer to that. Yes, sir. Thank you, Nikhil, for a very, very uh, enlightening sort of uh, lesson on economics. I'm not an economist, uh, and I'm also not a political scientist. So my question might sound very naive and very stupid. Uh, my question is about debt economy. When I was a kid, or maybe even when I was your age, my father would always say, Utni pair phelao jitni chadar ho. So only spend what you have saved, do not borrow. That was the motto he taught me. While in the West, it's all about 
you know, borrowing and then thinking about spending, you know, spending first and bo by borrowing and then saving. India is going the same way as you've shown. What I don't understand is this debt economy principle when countries like US is borrowing, you know, in trillions and trillions of dollars. So where does, where do they borrow from? You know, India wants money invested, so we go you know, to foreign countries, we say, could you invest? FDI, foreign direct investment. So this, this whole uh, debt economy seems to be like a, a mirage, like a, you know, not a real thing. Can you explain in very simple terms? Right. Especially for the students like me and them, what, why, do we, why do we have to go towards debt economy? Why can't we follow the basic principles taught to us uh, earlier? Right. So, I will be answering this question, but I am also a student because this entire debt economy thing is so recent. It only started in 1980s. In fact, if you look at South Korea or Singapore or Taiwan, at the end of 1980s, when they had achieved three decades of high growth, their debt to GDP ratio was less than 150% of GDP. Right? So these economies did well without debt. China, on the other hand, is one economy which has actually been totally debt-fueled growth model that we have seen. And now we all know, as you correctly said, how is it happening? It's very easy. A bank clicks something and debt is created. Right? It is very, very easy for, and that is why, again, I mentioned it, that it, it is very much possible for any economy in the world at any point in time to grow GDP at 7%, at 8%, 6% for a few years. Debt is one of the ways you can do that. Right? What you have to do, you have to tell the banks, or the banks have to realize on their own, that if somebody comes to borrow, I have to give money to them. Let's assume for the starting point, debt levels are very low. Let's say at this point in time, there is a country where the debt levels are at 10% or 20% of GDP. Savings will also be low, of course. GDP will also, everything will be low. But some, somewhere, the financial sector of that country gets an idea that we can actually become big if we give more debt. And they start lending to any individual, any company who comes in. Let's stick to the private sector for now. Let's assume government is not borrowing too much. It's a difference between private and government. For the initial years, everything will be good. You give more debt, which means a person has more money to spend. You spend, it means a person who receives money, whose income is hai, he is happy to produce, and this becomes a virtuous cycle. And this may continue for a few years, or for a few quarters to a few years. Easily, it can continue for uh, two years, four years, five years, seven years. I don't think it can continue for a long period of time, but I don't know where it will end. I'm sure it cannot continue for 25 years, which is what we are discussing. But let's assume it continues for five years. So five years, everything goes really well. Debt growth, which was 5%, is like, let's say, 25% for the next five years. Debt to GDP, which was 10%, becomes 25%, 30% five years down the line. And then after a point in time, you will see some sort of tension or problem that is created in one small segment of the borrower's community. It is very obvious. It may not necessarily has to be an economic reason. Somewhere someone will realize, boss, itna sara debt hai. Maine borrow kiya ho. Agar maine willing, will, willful defaulters, jiko hum bolte hai. Even if I have the capacity, I just don't repay. Kya farak pad jaya hai economy mein? Itna kuch, haa, whoever. Itna kuch borrow kar raha hai, kya farak pad jayega? And that kind of thinking, malab, there could be multiple reasons for this trigger to happen. I'm just giving you one very simple reason. Let's say willful default happen, and they happen, they do happen. Because initially when you take debt, you become big, you are spending, so you believe that I can do anything kind of, you feel that arrogance or you feel that I am very big, I can do whatever I want to do. One of the possible reasons for this thing to get triggered. And that is when the downturn starts. Because when that one person is unable to give loans, 
when whenever this and this is something which we all know when the debt cycle begins it begins with very simple vanilla products ki maine aapko loan diya baat khatam but when it continues and you see that my gdp growth is picking up aapne loan leke wo kisi aur ko loan diya aapne apne aap ko insurance karane ke liye us insurance company ne wapas mere se hi mera hi paisa insure karne ke liye loan liya so on that one particular loan it's not only one person who is connected it's actually five to six data points that we have for one particular loan so jab aap default karte ho wo insurance company bhi affect hoti hai main bhi affect hota hu और वो इंश्योरेंस कंपनी की वजह से मैं डबल इंपैक्ट होता हूं क्योंकि इस इंश्योरेंस कंपनी ने ऑलरेडी बैंकिंग सेक्टर से ही लोन लिया हुआ है आपको इंश्योर करने के लिए राइट सो दिस इज हाउ इट इट लुक्स लाइक इट्स अ स्मॉल ट्रिगर बट व्हेन इट हैपेंस वो एक चिंगारी से ही पूरा आग लग जाता है दिस इज समथिंग वी हैव सीन अगेन इट मे टेक ईयर्स फॉर एग्जाम्पल वी नो चाइना में इट हैज एक्चुअली बिकम वट इट हैज बिकम बिकॉज ऑफ दिस एंटायर कॉन्सेप्ट की मेरे को डेट पे चलना है और मैं चल सकता हूँ but we know it ends we know it has ended in china now nobody is talking about china becoming the first major country uh, the largest country everybody is worried ki uska growth 2% hoega 3% hoega 1% hoega kya hoega how will in an autocracy can you survive with such low growth rates will it become another japan of 1980s jahan par there will be revolts and kuch 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 hoega you will never be able to achieve your peaks that you have seen for the next few decades these are the kind of questions now there are for china for the us again us is a very special case sir being the holder of the global currency gives you a lot of advantages and a lot of drawbacks as well it puts a lot of limits on you but one <coughs> serious advantage you have is that you actually run a very high deficit but still you can survive for a very long period of time so this is something which can happen which has happened and which will continue to happen in a lot of countries the ending is never good in these things so what does the us borrow again when we hear that us who gives money to so first china for example so it's all about who are the surplus countries who are the borrower countries when we talk about the world net balance is zero there are equal numbers of surplus countries not equal numbers of i mean the total surplus of the surplus countries will always be equal to total deficits of the deficit country us is the biggest deficit country china is the biggest surplus country most of the money that china has the surplus that is has where will it invest it will invest in another economy which has a capacity to absorb that kind of money stable and stable of course us is the most institutionally freedom country stable country laws are extremely well defined property rights all those things financially stable ha matlab otherwise if you look at the policy of the us you will say matlab it doesn't look like they are the supreme power and i will never suggest anyone to follow what the us has done but us has special status in a lot of areas which has allowed it to be what it is today but most of the money that comes from is from the surplus countries so do you think that that is what leads to war that is what leads to war, war. war i think is is driven only by human emotions i don't think there is a, any ever any economic reason or economic logic for a war there has never been any economic logic if anybody tries to justify war on economic reasons i'm sure he will say don't do it for economic reasons international relations there are economic trade war oh okay but sir if you are actually interested in economics if you are interested in economics and how this debt thing and how this us china entire globalization is doing to the debt part i would strongly suggest to read books and works of professor michael pettis if you have heard about he is a professor at peking university china i am extremely inspired by his work i have mentioned his work in the book as well he has done a lot of work on this thing professor michael pettis yes sir um slightly different uh, uh, point but related how serious is america's debt problem and how will it affect america's gdp uh, potential going forward debt problem is very serious only if you believe that whenever it becomes a problem the policy makers will not do more stupid things 
to let that problem out of control. So what happens, what we have seen, and this is something we have seen for the last 25 years, more so in the last 15 years after great financial crisis, is whenever there is a problem that comes into the economy, economic problem, the policymakers, primarily the central bankers, they come in and try to suppress the problem as much as possible mm -hmm. with the unlimited power that they have of creating money, right? You know that central banks can create money out of thin air. They have the printing machine. If you have debt, if you are in the good books of the central bank, and primarily, again, central banks do not uh, interact with individuals. They interact with the banks or the banking sector or financial sector with, of any system. All the debts are eventually given by the financial sector, right? So the US debt problem is a very big problem, but what we have seen and what we hear or listen, for example, student loans that we have, education loans that we have in the US, they are now more than one trillion rupees, one trillion dollars, sorry, one trillion dollar, which is becoming a big problem. But what we hear at the same time is that there are plans that are being discussed to waive off that student loan debt. Now we are talking about the US economy, the most advanced economy, the most capitalistic economy, the economy which has taught us so much about the economics, such a wealthy economy, and they are talking about waiving off loans for their students. If they do that, my understanding is all these poor economies, middle income countries, emerging markets like India, there will be a lot of sections in these economies as well which will come up if they can do it, why can't you do it? Right? And it becomes very difficult politically for the government to explain them that what they are doing is actually not right, so we should not be doing it. When you are talking to the voting class, you can't expect these kind of answers from the, from the political arena or the governments. So it becomes a very problematic area. Fiscal deficit in the US is already a very big problem. I mean, last year, they told us that the fiscal deficit will be f roughly under 5% of GDP, and it was more than 8% of GDP. So they told us less than 5%, and they actually delivered more than 8% of GDP. And still, their bond markets are absolutely calm. India, I said 6.1% or 6.3% will our bond market. That is the kind of power they have because the federal bank can actually do a lot of things which can keep things calm only in the short term. Again, for this year they cannot repeat that because what they did last year cannot be repeated this year. So when it will become a problem, I don't know, one year, two year, five years, but it definitely will become a problem if they continue like this. Yes, sir. Yeah, Nikhil, in conclusion, you know, uh, last two yeah, uh, just, 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 uh, uh, tell us that uh, you said uh, if India has to become a, a powerful economy, it, has, it needs sustained growth over two decades, GDP growth. So in conclusion, can you tell us in simple terms, what are the two things that India needs to do seriously? And is the present, uh, uh, you know, um, government doing that? The objective is to achieve, let's say, 8% growth for two decades. So first thing, that two decades will start after one decade. You need to seriously consider that. Use that one decade to address these structural issues. Now the one thing that I explained in the book, why am I talking ki 2047, why is 2040s such an important decade? Why can't you say, okay, I'll continue to grow up and down for the next two decades and then after two decades I'll think about the structural issues you're talking about, why now? One of the important things when we talk about growth is the population or the working age population growth. India is one of the very few countries right now where working age population is growing. For China, US, Europe, Japan, working age population is already declining. Okay. For India, working age population growth will start declining in late 2040s. Okay. So that is when it becomes start becoming a problem for India. Why that becomes a problem? Simply because when you have more older people and less young generation, 
you have less people to work but more mouths to feed. So the dependency ratio becomes more. You have more dependents. The older you become, the less will be your ability to work. The younger you are, the more you will be able to work, the more your savings can be, the more your consumption and income can be. So, for, so you have to achieve a particular level of income before you start aging. That is why it is very important for India to bring its entire house in order before the end of 2040s. So one thing that they must do if they are serious about this long term objective is that they should address these issues. And one of the ways which the government actually can totally control, again, okay, the solutions that I am giving as Sir said, they are actually not solutions. They are solutions, but they are not short term solutions. Because I think and my experience has been that when someone asks you for a solution, they are looking for quick fixes. They want me to give answer to the result in one year. Otherwise, it is not a solution. I don't define solution that way. I define solution, the objective jo hai, uska solution. So if you want 8% growth for 20, 25 years, the second solution is fiscal deficit or government debt has to come down. Matlab, it has to come down dramatically. Even if debt has to go up, let the private sector take more debt because they are more capable of doing good work with, they are more efficient, let me put it, they are more efficient with their borrowings than the government sector. So these are the two quick things that I can think of. Hello. Yeah, Hi. I have one doubt. Uh, what I understood is that uh, savings is essential for long term growth, right? Now, my observation, I could be wrong, is that uh, today's government is, uh, you know, promoting consumption rather than saving on, uh, on their individual savings. Okay, so I find that there is a skew towards consumption-led growth rather than investment-led growth. So questions, two questions. One, uh, is my point of view correct? Second, uh, is that the right way to do, do it or what is your viewpoint on that? Thank you. Thank you, sir. So first, yes, your viewpoint is correct. In fact, I have mentioned that in the book that most of the policies that we have seen, not only from the government, but many from the RBA as well, they are actually towards encouraging consumption. So yes, they are leading to, they are driving consumption-led growth. And as I have explained, I don't think this is the right way to go. You can continue with it for a few years, but definitely not for long. Because as you continue to incentivize consumption more and more, your savings continue to fall and there is a limit to which savings can fall. There is a limit. We have already fallen to 30% of GDP and we have stabilized there. If we continue to grow at 7% for next two years as well, it is very likely my savings will fall to 28, 27%. And if I continue to grow at fast pace, the only way is if I keep saving less and less. And I have already explained you why savings are important. So. First, you're right in your assessment that the policy makers are actually incentivizing consumption-led growth. And second, no, I don't think that is the right way to grow if you actually want to be a developed country in terms of per capita income by 2040's end. I think you have been uh, <laughs> saying just about everything that's been asked. Uh, so, uh, uh, Nikhil, uh, thank you so much uh, for spending some time with us. And once again, congratulations on the book. Uh, you know, despite your day job, I hope there will be another book to write uh, soon. And in fact, uh, you could spend some time even here, as I was mentioning, you know, yes. two years from now, it would be wonderful to have you stay with us for a month working on your book. Uh, Thank you everyone for coming, uh, students and everyone else uh, who decided that 10.30 was not too early to, to listen to serious <laughs> economics. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and on a topic like the 8% solution. You know, it's not something you think of early on in the day, but you know, <laughs> more so by the end of the day. <laughs> How are we going to grow at 8%? What am I going to consume? What do I have to borrow? Uh, anyway, thank you all and uh, thank you, Nikhil. <laughs>
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.